Hello, I'm David Muskill, and today I'm going to talk to you about angioid streaks. You might see these angioid streaks when you're looking at someone's retina. They're called angioids because they look like blood vessels, but they're not. You can tell because they're browner than vessels and they emanate from the optic disc rather than from the central retinal vessels. They can actually be quite difficult to spot, so look carefully. The reason they can be difficult to spot is because they're not on or within the retina, they're actually below it. The retina sits atop the innermost layer of the choroid, the Bruch's membrane. It actually has layers of its own. It's a pleasingly symmetrical sandwich. The pieces of bread are the basement membrane of the retinal pigment epithelium and the basement membrane of the choreo capillaries. Then on the inside, you've got an inner collagenous layer and an outer collagenous layer. And the filling in the middle, well, that is a band of elastic fibres. Five layers in total, so we call it a pentalaminous structure. But really, it's just a stretchy sheet of extracellular matrix. And it's stretchy because of all of that collagen and elastin in the middle of it. The reason I'm emphasising the membrane stretchiness is because angioid streaks are what happens when you lose that. There are many diseases that cause calcification and thickening of the Bruch's membrane causing it to lose that elasticity and instead develop an egg-like brittleness. So what do you think happens next? That's right, it cracks. That's what angioid streaks are. They're cracks in the Bruch's membrane, which can then cause overlying atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, leading to that reddish brown color. They can develop spontaneously or they can be caused by even a minor trauma some say you shouldn't even do an indented indirect ophthalmoscopy exam on these patients just in case. You should always at least warn these patients to wear eye protection when doing anything that might risk their eyes. So why do we care about these cracks? We care because once you've got a crack in this barrier between the retina and the choroid, new blood vessels can start to grow through to the retina. Choroidal neovascularization, and we hate choroidal neovascularization. New vessels bleed and cause general havoc. So we tend to monitor patients with angioid streaks just in case this happens. And if it does, we can treat it with intravitreal anti-VEGF, just like other causes of choroidal neovascularization. To reiterate, unless choroidal neovascularization happens, angioid streaks do not cause any symptoms. Well, actually, they can cause a decrease in visual acuity if they creep in on the macula, but that's rare. Right, now let's look at some associated signs, because there's more than one sign of stress at Bruch's membrane. Indeed, angioid streaks represent quite a major stress at Bruch's membrane. A minor stress may be recognised by a sign we call Comet Tail Drusen. These are deposits of junk at the retinal pigment epithelium, which look like golden nuggets. They're usually a lot larger than normal drusen, and they have a comet-like tail that radiates centripetally. This tail is a streak of retinal pigment epithelium atrophy, so you can see it better on autofluorescence. We think it represents a line of stress in the Bruch's membrane that's below the threshold needed to cause a full thickness crack. The other sign of stress at Bruch's membrane is called peur d'orange, which is French for orange skin, because it's a diffuse mottling of the retinal pigment epithelium, which makes the retina look like orange skin. So all that remains for me to tell you now is what diseases actually cause all of this. Luckily, there's a well-known mnemonic, Pepsi. Pseudoxanthoma elasticum, Ehlers-Danlos disease, Paget's disease of the bone, sickle cell disease and other haemoglobinopathies, and idiopathic. Yes, up to 50% of angioid streaks are idiopathic. However, less than 1% of people with Ehlers-Danlos disease end up having angioid streaks, so you can probably forget that one. The same percentage is true of sickle cell disease, so you can probably forget that one too. The most important systemic association to remember is therefore Pseudoxanthoma elasticum because 60 to 80% of these patients have angioid streaks, compared to 20% of Paget's disease of the bone. Makes sense, both of these conditions cause abnormal calcification. In fact, any cause of hypercalcinosis may cause angioid streaks in the end. That's everything you need to know about angioid streaks then. I guess it may also be useful to know the most common differentials though, so that's what I'll actually end on you're most likely to confuse angioid streaks with the lacquer cracks seen in pathological myopia because they also represent cracks in the Bruch's membrane. They often co-occur with posterior staphyloma because the cracks in this case are caused by continued growth of the eye. 
Yeah, they're basically like stretch marks seen in pregnancy or body builders. The way you tell the difference between angioid streaks and lacquer cracks is that lacquer cracks don't radiate from the optic disc, instead tending to be located at the posterior poles. They're also more reticular in appearance. The other thing you might confuse angioid streaks with is a choroidal rupture, as might be seen in trauma. These are easier to recognise though, because the lesions in choroidal rupture are linear or crescent-shaped and follow the contours of the optic disc. Both lacquer cracks and choroidal ruptures may lead to choroidal neovascularization, so you'll probably end up treating them the same way anyway. Here ends my tutorial on angioid streaks. I hope you learned something or two, and if you didn't, at least have the good grace to pretend you did. Thank you for watching.